Hello. This is one of our last panels today for CalExit 2.0 uh, conference, and perhaps the most important one. Uh, the CalExit movement has been able to do something that's historic. For the first time ever in the history of California, uh, indigenous tribes, representing at least members of three different uh, indigenous nations or tribes, came together and talked about how they would like all federal land returned to them. Half of California is owned by the federal government. Californians don't like that. And this land is being poorly managed by the federal government with routine forest fires. Um, indigenous people, it's their land. It should go back to them. And rather than have the federal government fight California for the land, I think it would be better to return it to the rightful owners. There was a formal genocide in California against the indigenous people. Uh, when Americans came illegally into California and overthrew it, uh, instituted basically an apartheid regime and then a formal genocide campaign where they were literally paying uh, pennies on the head for indigenous heads. And uh, Californians who had immigrated from America, I wouldn't even call them Californians, they were Americans, um, they were here for a year and they went around uh, shooting in indigenous people chopping off their heads and literally bringing carts full of indigenous people's heads to Sacramento for money and tax money paid for that. Now that's not something that's we would do today, but it is technically still the same California government that did that. Recently, Governor Newsom issued an apology recognizing this genocide. That is an incredible move and takes great leadership and is very much something to be proud of. However, the governor said in his statement something to the effect of, too bad we can't go and right the wrongs of the past. Well, when we talked to indigenous people in CalExit, we said, is that okay? And they said, no. You know, more needs to be done. Uh, there was an article that came out after the governor's speech where indigenous people said, yeah, we'd like more. And when you looked into what more meant, they were talking about, why can't you give us our land back? If you admit you committed a genocide, why can't we have land back? Half of that land in California, Californians don't live in. It's not attached to our economy. We're not part of it. There's no good reason to oppose returning all the federal land, or at least vast amounts of it, back to the indigenous. Now, I hope that they would choose to form their own nation, and I would hope they would choose to have it in partnership with California, but that's going to be up to them. We as Californians have a duty to pay back a genocide. And the good news is the cost is cheap. We're not going to curt our economy. We're not going to force anybody out of homes. They simply don't live on it. And the federal government does not manage this land well. Why don't we fire them and replace them with someone else? We had our first listening session recently with members of the Ohlone, Nisanon, and Mountain Maidu, hosted by the Nisanon uh, Nation, talking about how they like federal land returned to them. And that, yes, they felt it would help them uh, help to get over the genocide. With that, we had other California uh, in nationalists. Uh, Sue Hirsch and Matt Owens were there representing CalExit. And they're going to talk about the experiences they had at that first listening session and how they feel about this idea of returning federal land to the indigenous in general. Sue? Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. My name's Sue Hirsch, and um, there's a traditional question that we ask on Passover that goes, how is this night different from all other nights? That's a question we ask four different times on Passover, just that way. And we answer it in four different ways. And um, I'm starting with it, and I want you to remember it for later, because I'm going to get back to it. I want you to just remember that question. How is this night different from all other nights? <coughs> Excuse me. And. Um, while you're keeping that in mind, I want you to also keep in mind that I was a very sheltered child. 
I didn't, excuse me, <clears throat> I didn't hear about the Trail of Tears. And I heard very little about Japanese internment camps. And um, if I had, I would have died of shame in the first decade of my life. Instead, we watched Muppets Before Bed, and Bubby would come over in the, the hor most horrible part of winter in Missouri, and she would make mandel bread and, and pesadilla bagels for us. And we would go up to Tahoe uh, and stay at our house in the, in the summers um, on North Shore Lake Tahoe, beautiful house beautiful place. And those bagels were so delicious that they never ever made it to Passover. And that left just the ritual part of the Seder. Um, the Seder, Seder is a word that means order, just means order in English. And it was the ritual meal on Passover that we would eat. We would eat. And with that meal came some blessings, and we'd point to the symbolic foods on, on the Seder plate, and we'd bless each one, you know, Baruch Atad, Anoyel, Heinu Melech HaOlam, Sherkid Shana, Peri or whatever it was. Um, and then we'd go on with a little more of the story and bless another symbolic food. And finally, finally, the end came, and there was uh, the Afiko men, and, and thank goodness, you know, Finally, it's over. We've eaten the afikomen because the afikomen is matzah, and I don't love matzah greatly. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I just don't. Um, so I'm going to honor my <clears throat> elders, excuse me, and go back and ask that question again. But I'm going to ask it in a different way, probably in a different way than they imagined. Excuse me. So let's ask ourselves, how is today going to be different from all other days, from the days of our past? How is it going to be different? How are we going to make it different? It's different for me because normally I don't speak. I write. And you can hear it in my voice. I'm honored to speak today, and I intend, but, excuse me, I'm having a problem with this because I'm nervous. You're doing, <laughs> you're doing great. great. You're doing great, Sue. Come yes. on. You're doing you're great. Really outstanding, I, outstanding. Thank you. I intend my words to be a gift, and if I say all the right words, maybe you'll see the hope that I see for California as a nation. For those who don't know me, my name is Sue Hirsch, Used, and my family name is Shaw, and it used to be Chernus until we immigrated from uh, the Ukraine or, or Prussia, somewhere around there, and my family uh, is a family that were Holocaust victims, so my Hebrew name <coughs> is Shlomi Gershona. Yeah. Right on. I'm, an, I'm a daughter. I'm a mom blogger. I'm a wife. I'm an author of children's books. I'm a retired child care worker of about 10 years. I'm a retired massage therapist of about 20 years. I'm a retired radio show hostess of a few years. I'm a Ren Fair actor. And now I'm an activist of a few years. I'm an activist pushing for a nation of California that will provide equal opportunity and equal representation for all her people, especially in including the Native Americans that we killed so many of so long ago. But it's still going on. We're still doing it. We're still kidnapping and killing the Native American women. So it hasn't stopped. I was asked to speak here on that, on that genocide and on the idea of beginning these conversations 
with our Native American brothers and sisters and how the immigration policy of today is different or the same uh, from the Holocaust camp, the Holocaust concentration camps of the 40s. And I think we can all agree that there's absolutely no difference because the, defini the definition of a concentration camp is any, any facility where people are kept in, uh, imprisoned that, and in conditions that are overcrowded and just intolerable and unacceptable and completely inhumane. And they really are. Um, my dad's folks, um, my dad's folks immigrated from the, the Ukraine and Prussia areas, Jews, and they came from those concentration camps and that sort of a background. And my mom's dad went in and he saw evidence of what had happened um, because he went in as a doctor after the war and um, was helping to set up that mass unit. And um, he was right there and went in and saw a concentration camp and how horrible that was. So since we're seeing evidence that times <coughs> have not changed as much as we'd like to believe, we need to rephrase the question, the traditional Passover question, a little more like this. How are we going to be different from our conquering and invading ancestors? How are we going to be different from our colonizing ancestors? So let's ask ourselves that again in a minute. Excuse me. First, who are they? These ancestors that I'm talking about. Well, they started coming over just after Columbus, and he really didn't discover the Americas first. He wasn't the first one to discover us um, or, or the land. He just sort of took the credit for it. And then we came in, and we started killing the Native Americans and taking their children and, and taking their land and turning their children into little Americans by cutting their hair and changing their names and telling them, you can't speak your languages anymore. You have to speak English. And they had many, many languages. That's why I'm saying language, language is plural, because they actually were many nations, many different tribes that lived all over this yeah. land. Mm -hmm. And we told them, you can't speak your languages anymore. You have to speak English because we're here now and this is our land and we discovered it. And um, that's, that's completely bogus. They were already here when we discovered it. Um, and Germany actually made amends after the Holocaust for over 60 years, you know, and they got right on it after that war. They said, you know what, we were wrong, and uh, here's what we'll do. We'll take some money and we'll put it into creating a state of Israel just for the Holocaust victims and the refugees. And that's what they did. And so right now, California is taking the same sort of important step and having what we call listening roundtables. We are listening to our Native American brothers and sisters tell us what kinds of amends and reparations they would like to have us make. And they're saying, you know what? We want our land back. And you know what? That's the right thing to do, and there's plenty of federal land to go around, and California doesn't want to be part of the U.S. anymore, so that federal land that right now belongs to the U.S. that they're not even taking care of or using could be given to the Native Americans, to our indigenous brothers and sisters. We could give that land back to them, and they would be so happy to have that land because there's plenty of it, and right now that land is just languishing, and they have a use for it, and it used to be their land anyway. Just like all the rest of this land you know, was their land anyway, and the land I'm standing on right now is Tongva land. Thank you for mentioning it, Marcus, because right I had no idea what tribe had been here before. And they want their land back. 
So if we look closely, we can see a pattern. This is something we've done to the Native American Indians. It's something that Germany did to the Jews. It's something that America is doing to the asylum seekers. And it's something that uh, America is, has done to black people and brown people and LGBTQ people. And this is, this is a pattern for America. They you know, they're oppressors. They go to war and they oppress subgroups of people. Every time you turn around, they're oppressing another subgroup of people. And these are, these subgroups of people are Americans. Um, I was born in San Francisco. I'm a native San Franciscan, um, you know, as well as being all these other things, as well as being a mom, as plum, mom blogger, as well as being a wife and a, and, and a daughter and Jewish. I'm also a native San Franciscan. And, you know, as long as I see that any subgroup of humans is being persecuted or oppressed, then I am still you got this. persecuted and oppressed. So what can we do? What can we do about it? We can emulate England. When, <coughs> when she opened her arms to Sir Winston's 669 kids that he smuggled in from the Holocaust camps. He smuggled, he smuggled them into England from the Holocaust camps on the trains. And we can remember the 500 broken treaties. You got this. You got this. You're doing very well. You're on it. And we can do better than those 500 plus broken treaties that we made with the Native Americans. And we can close down the concentration camps on California soil. Right. That was terrible. I'm sorry. Oh, you did great. Yeah. Let's play rotating chairs. Matt, yeah. Your turn. Sue, come over here and see where I'm sitting. Hello, everyone. Wish I could give such a speech, but well, I come to you from. Yuviatam land, the people of the pines. And if anybody had any doubts of that, all they have to do is look at one of the world's hottest springs at the foot of the San Bernardino Mountains and see a great big arrowhead. It's kind of like a billboard what says, this is indigenous land, this is indigenous water. Well, Stories like Sue's are part of our history, integral actually, because, you know, of course you have uh, the first, the uh, Spaniard conquest and the making of the indigenous people into serfs using the feudal system of serfdom. And then you have the restoration of uh, sovereignty through Mexican sovereignty and the attempt to return the mission land to them well, they welcome the return of the land, but this is the missions. It's, you know, this is a Spaniard idea. You can have them, you know, we'll go home, which they did. And then came another turn of sovereignty to the U.S., and then the fun begins because they wanted to settle, okay, and they wanted to mine, and they wanted to do all those things. So, and you had different groups of Americans coming with different ideas. This, for example, the Mormons in 1850s, uh, built their uh, stockade uh, near the courthouse of what is now San Bernardino, uh, a name taken from a, from a, a little assistencia near Redlands, where they were ensurfed. And they wanted to take between Salt Lake City and San Bernardino and make a state of Desjardins. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, Ute land, okay, the Paiutes and so on, and uh, Western Shoshone and so on. He didn't ask him. But 
again, troubles between the Americans got in the way because there was that difference over slavery resulting in the Mormons recalling from San Bernardino their, their people back to Salt Lake to figure out, well, what are we going to do now? It looks like the slave states and the free states are going to war. And what are we going to, what are we going to do? Okay. Um, and then came actual Civil War battles over our gold fields in Holcomb Valley, which happened to be the, uh, the winter home, or the summer home, forgive me, the summer home of the Uviatan was Bear Valley. Their uh, winter home was down here in San Bernardino Valley, so they would go back and forth every year, migrate. Made sense to them. Didn't make sense to the miners. So after the battles uh, between the Union forces on Union Flats, hence the name, and the Confederate forces on Arastory Flats for no particular reason, except there was a, a town there called Belleville that they settled before the Civil War that was almost our county seat, almost. Uh, after the Civil War was done and the Confederates were defeated and Belleville was not the county seat, well, the U of Vietnam are still doing what they're doing, okay, going back and forth. Uh, made sense to them. But those miners wanted all the gold, and so they massacred. They committed an act of attempted genocide against the Uviatan. Attempted, they're still there. Uh, their uh, leader, Santos Manuel, negotiated with the federal government a reservation where they could be protected from the settlers, and they got it, where there's to this day, by the way. So he led them uh, from the, you know, the places where they had ranged to the San Manuel Reservation, which is where they discovered a disturbing truth. Before there were Nazi concentration camps, before there were uh, Bantu stands in South Africa, before the slice and dice that's been done to Palestine, before any of that, there were the reservations. Okay, the reservations served to remove the indigenous population to as inhospitable an area as possible. Okay, this happened to all the indigenous nations on the North American continent. Um, right next door to the Uviatam is the Kawiya, and the Kawiya people are scattered over like five different reservations. That used to be all where they arranged, through the Banning Pass and into uh, Coachella Valley. That was their range. You know, not that many of them because this is, this is desert, okay? But, oh, no, the Southern Pacific had its ideas as to what they wanted to do with that. And so, first of all, they says, okay, you no longer can range across these uh, passes and valleys. You're going to be on this reservation, this reservation, this reservation, and you're going to be totally separate from one another, okay? Your sovereignty only to pertain separately. There is nothing that binds you to one another anymore, and then they took one of the largest reservations where they had a, another hot springs, Agua Caliente, and they says, oh, well, the Southern Pacific would really like some of that. And so we're going to slice it and dice it. Here, 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 here. It's going to be the reservation. There, 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 there. Isn't. Okay, so they sliced and diced the Agua Caliente reservation. But history sometimes has a way of getting the punchline. And in this case, what happened was that Two cities, uh, Palm Springs you may have heard about, Cathedral City just to the north. Every other parcel is of its largest landowner, the reservation. So those two cities are governed plurinationally. Okay, before anybody even thought of the word plurinational, they were doing it. Okay, with uh, Palm Springs, Cathedral City, and the Agua Caliente Reservation all governing that land together. Oh, and Riverside County, because some of it is outside city limits. So the practice came before the theory that we now see in Bolivia or that we're looking at because what thing we do not want to do, we don't want to uh, divide California into an indigenous Palestine and a settler Israel. We saw how that worked the last time, not too well. No. So that's not what we have in mind. We have a treaty obligation that's been upheld in the courts uh, to return the public land, okay? So the indigenous people I talk to, they ask, well, what about the rest of it? 
This is Uvietam land. This is Kuwait land. This is Tongva land. Uh, Miwok. Uh, now, what are you going to do? So, the idea here is to look at right across the border to the, the mother country, to Mexico, what they're doing to crapple the situation. And they have something called the uh, CNAE, the uh, National Indigenous Congress, which, <coughs> by the way, is the first civilian uh, authority recognized by the Zapatistas. And they go to the Mexican government and demand the very sorts of things that indigenous people demand the world over. A stop to the... the Predation upon the land, the return of land to them, <clears throat> their incorporation as sovereign indigenous nations into the Mexican nation. Same goes for California, folks. Okay, same thing. That's only half that's public land. The rest, and that's what they told me when they, they, they threw it out. You know, this is get rid of that map. What's going to happen to our existing indigenous nations? Uh, well, again, the answer, we ourselves developed, okay, they themselves developed, and that is plurinational governance. So the idea is, we're, you know, we're not going to cut off uh, the land we're returning to them outright. Rather, what we're going to do is make sure that they have a branch of the California government uh, following Zapatista uh, uh, parlance, uh, I call it the uh, the California Indigenous Congress, Congreso Indígena California, and that is the idea that we will have plurinational governance from the get. We will have to consult with them on our development projects, and they feel it's unsound. They'll be able to veto those projects. Okay, so this will be a, pro a process by which our sovereignty and their sovereignty will be recovered together from the United States. Because guess what? If we don't, if they don't recover their sovereignty at the same stroke as we recover ours, okay, as the California Republic, guess what? Our sovereignty is a sham and a lie. Right. Okay. So that is what we are beginning to build in the listening sessions, and it's going very well. We plan to do these sessions all up and down California. We just started. We're just getting started. And the folks, the indigenous people who we listen to, they're looking to talk to the folks in the other uh, myriad indigenous nations of uh, the country of California. So yeah, we're just getting started. Oh, those musical chairs yeah. didn't go around. Um, so I just want to make a, a few comments. Uh, we just started the listening sessions. The idea is for us who are not indigenous and are part of Return California, everybody's invited to join, but it's led by indigenous people. And our plan is to get these listening sessions to become a phenomenon where indigenous people basically on their land make a video saying simply, yeah, we want uh, our land back and we're fine taking all the federal land you're willing to give to us. That's it. Uh, we did a whole production for the first one, but it doesn't have to be that way. If each individual, I think there's like, I'm not. Uh, About 150, over 150 recognized tribes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, and then there's like 60 or 90 undocumented, unrecognized, yeah. About 150 recognized tribes, about a 60 or something unrecognized. If they all just took a video saying, yes, this is us, we're on our land, here's our meeting, and we are saying, yes, we want federal land. That's the idea. Because then what happens is you have indigenous people saying, yeah, I want my land back. And then we go back to the governor and say, hey, last month you just made a speech about uh, genocide and apology. Turns out they want their land back. Uh, what was your plan? Just tell them, tough, genocide happened? He's not going to do that. He has painted himself against the wall. Mm -hmm. And we're jumping on that opportunity. And I like Newsom. I thought it took a lot of courage. But I also think it's not enough. We need to give as much land back as we can. I'm willing to take it right up to the point that it affects our economy. And that's why I'm like for the federal land. So... Uh, we're going to tell, um, 
we're going to point out that there's these viral videos from a bunch of indigenous nations doing this, and we're going to pressure the California government into doing that. And for people who say it's federal land, you can't give land back to them, it's illegal to do that, I would point to them our sanctuary cities law. That was called a violation of federal immigration authority. We just did it. They said it was unconstitutional. We just did it. They said you can't threaten companies not to share information with ICE officials. We just did it. And by the way, they got struck down after our attorney general said we're going to do it and the governor backed it up. So we just go ahead and say we're going to do whatever we want. If we can do that for marijuana, why can't we do it for the indigenous? You know, you're willing to say I ignore you on immigration, climate change, net neutrality. Why can't you do it for the indigenous? If every California politician was saying, look, our indigenous people do want their federal land back, we want to give it to them, then let's put the federal government in a position where they have to say, no, you don't get to have your land back, genocide, fair and square. Come on, do it. What's your counter argument going to be when people say, yes, we do want our land back? Tough. Uh, I enjoyed scalping your grandmother and chopping her head off. No, there's no good answer for this. They will be in a horrible position. By the way, the UN three years ago had somebody travel through America and they said, you should give their land back to them. So the UN is already on record doing this. So the federal government would put themselves in a horrible position. They couldn't go and in violation of the UN. All we have to do is have indigenous people make these videos saying it. And yes, it is that simple. And here's why. The LA Times wrote an editorial slamming the idea of returning land to the indigenous. Yeah. And I want to point this out. The LA Times writes articles. That's a newspaper reporter. And then they did the editorial board, meaning all the editors of the LA Times go, of all the stories we wrote about recently, which ones should we take a moment to comment on? Oh, the idea of returning back to the indigenous. What should we do? Support it? No, we should say it's a horrible idea. It should, quotes, go no further. And, quotes, if the indigenous want their land back, they can do it them damn selves. Now, I got to tell you, when we talk to indigenous people and I go, the LA Times said, if you want your land back, you should just do it on your own. And uh, obviously, if you haven't asked, you don't want your land back. Does that seem accurate? And they go, no. So I don't know who the hell the LA Times interviewed, but it wasn't indigenous people who are authentic. Yeah, they want their land back. So we're going to show the California government and the media and the people of California, yes, they do want their land back. And we're going to pressure political officials and everyone in California to basically say, hey, you don't get your land back because I committed a Nazi style genocide. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. You're going to lose. So what we need is more people to join Return California and to, we're working on a flyer, get the message out to the indigenous that, hey, if you make a simple video saying, yes, I would like my land back, we'll take it from there. Because the idea is to make this viral and then have all the non-indigenous pull out of Return California and focus exclusively on telling the rest of California who's not indigenous, did you see what they're saying? We're going to leave it to the indigenous to uh, do these videos, and then we're going to become town criers going, hey, we're not indigenous, you're not indigenous, look at what they're doing. They do want their land back. By the way, is, uh, do you, you agree genocide's a bad thing, right? <laughs> so it's foolproof. And for the CalExit members, while this isn't specifically a CalExit issue, a picture of that. California says they want to return all the federal land to the indigenous. Basically, we're kicking out the federal government for 50% of the land. Uh, yeah, that's going to get attention, and that's going to show that we kind of want to be independent. Whatever happens to the land will be up to the indigenous. Obviously, Matt has shown we've done some seriously thinking. Uh, there's some excellent examples of empowered and wealthy indigenous people in the Palm Springs mm -hmm. area because of that checkerboard pattern. There's also some really empowered indigenous communities in Latin America, uh, the Amazon, Bolivia, uh, Chile, I think. Uh, but it's going to be up to them, whatever they want. Uh, initially, yes, California presented this idea as a separate indigenous nation simply to get the discussion started. I also think that looking at Jewish people, looking at Roma, looking at the Kurds, if you don't have a nation, it's easy to get punked. Uh, 
1930, uh, the Japanese people were treated horribly in America. And then the Empire of Japan says, you better knock it off. And the federal government in 1930 started telling its own people to be less racist against Japanese. Think about that. Racist America, 1930s, the federal government said, knock it off. Why? Because Japan was a nation and had power. Same thing with Israel. Same thing with Mexico. You know, the Mexican government, when they hear really racist stuff, well, before Trump, <laughs> when they used to care, could say, hey, you can't treat Mexicans that way. And the federal government would at least attempt to do that. Indigenous people have no such power. There's no government to go to. There's nobody who can call the president and say, I demand a meeting, and they're worried about it. That don't happen. And so I was saying, look, if you want to be empowered, I'm sorry, but the name of the game under international laws, you got to have a nation. Or you get treated like the Roma, the Kurds. You can see how this goes. People without nations are Palestinians. Palestinians. People without nations are second-class citizens on the global oh. stage. So... If the indigenous people don't want to actually have a formal nation, that's up to them. But I got to tell you, you know, it's going to be more of the same. But it is their call. So whatever decision they make is theirs. I encourage everyone in Calix to join with us and get the message out to the indigenous and the non-indigenous that, yes, they do want their land. They simply make a video so we can make this happen. And boy, would it piss off a lot of people on Fox News. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a bad thing. <laughs> uh, questions from the audience? Yes, yes uh, I guess that would go either to Marcus or uh, uh, Matt, probably more to Matt. Um, I'm, I have to admit that I'm not knowledgeable, uh, so this might be kind of an ignorant uh, question to ask, but... Uh, How do you think I found out? Huh? <laughs> How do you think I'm I found You're knowledgeable about it. But so we're I talking wasn't. about federal <laughs> lands uh, that right now are not being... Uh, used or that we could get back. But what about, uh, obviously, tribes, I would think, were in the Los Angeles area, San Bernardino, yeah. where, where it's populated right now. Uh, how do you give that kind of land back, uh, where people that, are already living? That was what was asked of me by somebody who did not like our little map uh, from AIM. He says, what about the non-public land? Right. Okay, the other half where people are settled. You know, it's like trying to put the genie back in the bottle with Palestine and Israel. Uh, well, how you put that genie back in the bottle is that you uh, have a plurinational republic to where they have a fundamental branch of the government that represents them and only them. Okay, there's your nation right there. It's not a nation. It's the United Indigenous Nations of California, if you would. So each indigenous nation sends you know, its representatives to this California Indigenous Congress. And it has the same kind of veto power that, say, the Senate has now. And what does California really need a Senate for anyway? You know, we're not, you know, that's what they said in Venezuela. Why don't we have a Senate? You know, we have counties, you know. And so they says, well, let's make a, a, a unicameral uh, National yeah. Assembly, and they did. So we could do the same thing, and then we could look at things like, well, what's the basis of that National Assembly, you know, its basis of representation. We could thrash that out. But that's a separate issue from how they thrash their representation out as a separate uh, house or branch of government, the California Indigenous Congress. So it wouldn't be just about the half that we out and out return to them. They would be in charge of that through the CIC directly. Uh, and then as for the rest, like, where I come from, where Sue come from, where most of us come from, indigenous land that's no longer uh, public land, well, they have a fundamental branch of government that makes sure that they get heard about what happens there too. Okay? And they get heard, and of course this respects the indigenous uh, reservations, which again were set up like concentration camps, but are the prior sovereignty they have. Okay? So, like for example, uh, they would get back the Uvietam, the people of my land, they would get back the San Bernardino National Forest. Okay? Well, guess what happens to be there? Uh, what happens to be there is the place where uh, Nestle is uh, basically robbing us of water out of Strawberry Creek. Now, it does cross where the resort is now that they've uh, recovered. 
Uh, so they could say, oh no, your pipe's not going through our reservation any your reservation. That's right, our, we bought it fair and square. Now we're making it part of the reservation and we're cutting off Nestle. Okay. Uh, but this would give them, and they're looking forward to that. They're looking forward to being custodians of this land. Okay. And it's not always, it's not just the, the public lands. They want a voice in what happens in all of it. Is they have to put up with the consequences just like we do. Okay. And just and just just to go through a, a little bit more of that point though. So so yes, I get to Congress, I get that that gives them power, uh, political power and stuff. But what do you say if, for example, they they used to live on a land right now that's not Nestle, but that's populated mm. by uh, you know all kinds of Americans, whatever. Right. Uh, that, and they say you know. We want that land back. We want that piece of land. What do you, what do you say to them if they say, you know, that was our land, but you guys now are populated on it. How did they get, how do we mitigate them getting land like that that they, we can't possibly get? Well, like say, for example, if they wanted to lay claim to San Bernardino, which, you know, it is New Vietnam territory, or Riverside, which is Cahuilla, et cetera. So how do you or LA, that? which is Tonga. And... They understand well that you grind a sausage grinder backwards and you don't with pigs. You're not going to get what, uh, and I'll give you an example of that right out of San Bernardino. Uh, when the uh, air base was closed in Norton and converted into an international civilian airport, uh, the Uviatum were offered back the uh, housing. Okay, it was there. For the service people who had to endure it. And of course, you know, a, a bunch of land that wasn't going to be used for the new airport. And he says, Oh, great. You uh you poison our land with this jet fuel and these other chemicals, right? And now you're offering it back to us to clean yeah. up. Thanks, but no thanks. Uh you know, you you can keep it. Now there is an historical precedent, uh, what happened during Mexican California in which uh, there were certain of our uh, uh, independence fighters, like Juan Batista Alvarado, that wanted to offer the mission land back as part of the secularization deal. And they says, you know what? The only reason we're on these missions is because the Spaniards, you know, pressed us into service as serfs, okay? So yeah, we're going back to, you know, our traditional ways. And you know what? This mission right here, you can keep it. You can do whatever with it, you know? So a lot of it they wouldn't want back in its present condition. Okay. Why should they want the Los Angeles River back? Right. Okay, uh, which it would be like totally useless to them. You know, it's only useless to plaster fifty foot uh, useful to plaster fifty foot giant ants, and the rest you know goes out in the ocean. They might have an idea that hey, why don't you put some dams on there to keep the water? Why don't you? Uh, you know, break up what you're already doing through the Hollywood. Uh, uh, neighborhood council, they're talking about, I was at one of the meetings in which they were talking about, well, why don't you cut up the driveways so that the water, instead of just going out into the ocean, wasting that freshness, it percolates into the, the basin. Mm. Okay. Uh, one of the things they talked about